Welcome to Creation Training Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the founder and president of Creation Training Initiative, where our mission is to train others how to speak and teach on biblical creation and apologetics. Well, we have another very special guest with us today, and we're very privileged to have with us Dr. David Menton. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Menton. Well, let's see. Uh, the story, I guess, could be shortened to the point that uh, I graduated from college with a major in biology and a minor in chemistry. That was way back in 19 Bubba. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, was that in the last century? <laughs> yeah, right. That was in Minnesota, and then I went on to get a Ph.D. in cell biology from Brown, and... Uh, Spent a couple of years at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, in biomedical research. Uh, and then, if you could imagine, a young kid like me now, 75 last July, uh, I was 34 years in the faculty of Washington University School of Medicine. There I was in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. Uh, research and teaching is what I did. Uh, my teaching uh, involves some teaching of gross anatomy, but primarily a course called histology. It's really looking through the microscope uh, at the body. Got that name from a Greek word, histos. It means a web or a fabric. And our mm -hmm. body is indeed woven when you look through the microscope. In fact, we are so woven, you'd almost think that we were knit together in our mother's womb. Doesn't <laughs> the scripture have something to yeah, say about It does indeed, that. yes. Uh, I was a histology editor for several editions of Stedman's Medical Dictionary. Uh, was an invited uh, lecturer for a semester at Stanford University Medical School. Uh, did some research a couple summers at Woods Hole Marine Biology Laboratory. You know, now that I think of it, I have more science experience than Bill Nye, the science guy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, now uh, in my retirement, I'm working again. Uh, for the last uh, about 10 years since I retired in 2000, uh, I've worked with Answers in Genesis, uh, first out of St. Louis, now here in uh, Kentucky. And my responsibility there is primarily in the museum. I help make exhibits and do workshops and write articles. And I still do some traveling, too. Health has interfered a bit with that. But uh, I do travel and speak uh, as well. So I'm a speaker. Well, good. I, matter of fact, one of our granddaughters was in one of your classes on the microscope. And That's boy, right. did she enjoy it. She oh, learned great. a lot. Great. <laughs> great. So what are we going to do today? Have you ever heard somebody say, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. I've heard that once in a while. Yeah, I hear that too. In fact, I used to say that, and then somebody corrected me one day. They said, you know, you're not using faith in a biblical sense there when you say it takes faith to believe in evolution. Uh, the Bible defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. You usually don't think about substance and evidence when you're thinking about faith, but faith in God's Word is so reliable that uh, uh, you think in terms of substance and, and evidence. Uh, the fellow that cautioned me about using faith in association with evolution suggested that I use the word credulity. At first, I wasn't sure what the word credulity meant. So are we you... allowed to say words like that? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure what it meant, but, you know, I'm a professor. You can't admit this sort of thing. Yeah, so right. uh, I said, excellent point you have there. And then I went home, looked it up in the dictionary. Yeah. And the dictionary defines credulity as willingness to believe without evidence. And I'm sure you will attest that the faith we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is certainly with evidence. Yeah, uh, uh, evidence in our own lives, evidence in the lives of others who are Christians. And God has given us all this marvelous uh, evidence in his created works that we can see. So uh, I'm starting to use the word credulity when I speak of evolution. And you know, we all have a little bit of credulity. If I were to flip a coin and say heads, you'd accept that even if you didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And if I flipped it again and we got a head, uh, you'd accept that even if you didn't see it. But on the hundredth head, what do you know for sure? Well, if this is the cowboy days, I'd shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the hundredth head, you'd pretty well know something's going on here. You're not leaving this to chance. You're doing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the whole point that I want to make about evolution. Uh, when you look at the improbability of it all, somebody had to do something. This was not left to chance. It's amazing that people have the credulity to believe that it was left to chance. You know, evolution does depend on a considerable element of chance. Uh, I could give you lots of quotes from the literature of evolutionists who say that it involves chance. But uh, just a couple of uh, brief uh, quotes I think will suffice. 
uh, first consider these words from the very distinguished scientist Jacques Monod. Uh, he uh, won a Nobel Prize in biochemistry a number of years ago. Sadly, he died as a relatively young man, and even sadder, apparently, he died an unbeliever. Uh, he was pretty open about his atheism. He wrote a book called Chance and Necessity. And in this book, he said, everything you see in the biosphere, all living things, is a result of either chance or of uh, necessity. And by necessity, he meant the laws of nature. So chance and the laws of nature, you get everything. Specifically, he said, chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. Pure chance, absolutely free but blind, is at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution. Uh, to make it even clearer, so there's nothing uncertain here, Julian Huxley, another famous evolutionist, uh, arguably one of the most uh, famous of this past century, uh, Julian Huxley uh, said about evolution, nowhere in all of its vast extent is there any trace of purpose or even prospective significance. He said evolution is impelled from behind by blind physical forces, it's a gigantic and chaotic jazz dance of the particles and radiations. And you know, that would have been a good place to put a period there, but he didn't. He went on to say something that's hard for me to imagine. He, he said it, but he did. Remember, it's uh, now just uh, impelled by blind physical forces. It's a chaotic jazz dance of the particles and radiations in which the only overall tendency we've so far been able to detect is that summarized by the second law of thermodynamics, the tendency to run where? To run down. That would be the wrong direction. If you're going from an expanding cloud of hydrogen gas to, say, Albert Einstein, you need to go up someplace, a little up, huh? uphill. Uh, several years ago, I visited the uh, Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And uh, they uh, often have evolution exhibits there promoting evolution at taxpayers' expense. And this particular year I visited, they wanted to emphasize uh, the role of chance in evolution. And to do this, they actually incorporated a little gambling casino into the uh, exhibit right there at the Field Museum. Uh, here in this photograph, you can see I, I watched two young people go through. I like to think of them as maybe Tommy and Sally. They look like brothers and sisters. And they stopped over here at the picture on the uh, left, and uh, what we see there is called a dice layout. They have these in gambling casinos, uh, I've been told. Okay. <laughs> and uh, they were having a lot of fun throwing the dice. I'm just glad a lot of young kids nowadays don't read anymore, because if they would have read, over the top of that dice table was a sign that says, is life just a game of craps? Wow, that's a heavy philosophical hit to lay on these young children, huh? Uh, you know, craps, that's a slang word for, for throwing dice, for chance. Mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, your sister Sally there, is she just one big game of craps? Is she just chance? Your mother, your father, your, your Christianity, everything, is it all just chance? You know, I wonder if their parents prepared them for a philosophical challenge like this. I wonder if their pastor prepared them, their Sunday school teachers, if anybody prepared them to face up to, is life just all chance? Well, they went on to the next gambling device at the Field Museum of Natural History. It was the one-armed bandit. They cranked away on that, and over the top was another sign. It said, over time, tiny mutations add up to big changes. Well, I think I agree with them in part on that, but not quite the way that they have in mind. You see, here's a picture right here of tiny mutations. This is cancer. These are HeLa cells. They're kind of the guinea pigs of cell biology. They've been around a long time. And people have used them to study uh, uh, cancer cells. And uh, these particular cells came from the uh, cervix of a lady who had cervical cancer. And uh, she did die of this cancer, sadly, but the cells are still dividing. And uh, as I say, they've been used in biomedical research. These cells at this point have had so many mutations and are so highly abnormal, you'd never get a cervix out of it to say nothing of the young lady the cells were taken from. If you look at the nuclei, you can see some are big and some are small. That means there's odd amounts of DNA, uh, polyploid and aneuploid, odd numbers of chromosomes. So uh, that's a big change, cancer. <laughs> But I don't think they had that in mind. I think they meant that uh, small yes. mutations would add up to eyes and ears and livers and kidneys. But what do we know that they add up to? Mutations can add up to cancer. Well, if we have any evolutionists looking on today, 
they're going to say, yeah, you're talking about chance here, but you haven't really brought up the thing that makes evolution work, and that's natural selection. Natural selection makes it all happen. Uh, Ever heard any definitions of natural selection? Usually people will mention the one that Darwin talked about a lot, uh, mm -hmm. the survival of the fittest. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that expression, survival of the fittest, is kind of interesting. Let's just examine it. First of all, uh, natural selection works with mutations. Mutations are really the only source of fundamentally new genetic information, and the mutations we're talking about are random. Here's another thing, it's so obviously true, I'm embarrassed to even bring it up. It's kind of duh, but you can't select what's not there to be selected. So you cannot select a mutation or a gene that isn't already there to be selected. In other words, natural selection doesn't add anything new. Nothing new. It can only select from the chance mm -hmm. changes that have occurred there. And uh, it's kind of interesting if a person wants to do a little experiment, you might want to just go down to your local friendly Midas muffler dealer and order a dozen yellow roses. You won't get them, you know why? Because they don't stock them. But what if you really need them? You know, you forgot the wedding anniversary or something, then will they have them? No, you see, need doesn't play a role at all in natural selection. If they're not there when you want them or use them, uh, that's it. You can't make them appear. Uh, so survival of the fittest, that really is kind of the way people sum up natural selection, but you know that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Ever ask your question? Which creatures survive? It would be those that are fit, huh? Yes. And then, what exactly do we mean by fit? Why, it's those creatures that are able to survive. This is kind of going around in circles here, isn't it? Yes, it is. You might as well say that deafness is the principal cause of total loss of hearing. <laughs> it's true enough, it just doesn't say anything. You know, evolutionists were aware of this problem, oh, 50 years ago. Population geneticists knew that survival of the fittest just wasn't going anywhere. And they said, look, evolution could care less about the individual. Individuals do not count in evolution. It's the population. And so uh, they came up with uh, this definition of natural selection. It's just simply two words, differential reproduction. What does that mean? Simply means that those creatures, after having, say, a mutation, those that leave the most offspring, survive. That's it, random, purposeless, goalless, mindless change. And then when you get that change in the gene, do you leave more offspring or don't you? In other words, do you all proliferate your competitors out there? What about the role of mutations on increased uh, reproduction and productivity? We might go to Dr. James Crow, arguably one of America's greatest, if not the greatest geneticist, trained many, many research geneticists. At the time of this picture and quote, he was professor and chairman of genetics at the University of Wisconsin. He's now retired. Uh, but he said, and I quote, the typical mutation is very mild. He says, but it shows up as a small decrease in viability or fertility. That would kind of be the wrong way again, wouldn't it? Uh, according to this new definition or 50-year-old definition of natural selection, it should be going uphill, not downhill. Well, let's get back to that word credulity. We talked about credulity, the willingness to believe without evidence. And uh, what we want to establish is, uh, Mike, what's your credulity factor? Okay, is, is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> we all have a certain amount of it. Okay. That's, now, are you gonna get into big numbers here? <laughs> <laughs> Not right away, uh, okay. we're gonna sneak up okay. on it. Yeah, we'll sneak up on it very gradually. For example, uh, take uh, playing cards here, uh, a yellow card, a green card, a blue card, and a red card. These four colors, if I were to mix them up, and uh, we'll just put them down on the table here in a pile, put them right down there. If I were to uh, have you tell me one of those colors, and I were to write one of those colors down on a piece of paper, what would be the chance the color you picked would be the one I picked? One in four? One in four, yeah, or 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, now, somebody said, well, you might run into favorite colors, and blue is one of the favorite colors. You can see you and I both have yes. some blue on today. Uh, so to get away from uh, favoritism and color, I made up this little easel here. And we'll just take the cards as they landed there, shuffling them, and put them in these little pockets. One, two, pocket three, and pocket four. 
Now I have a prediction card on the back where I will try to predict what card it is that you will pick. You got one chance in four of pulling this one off. <laughs> you see over here on the back is this uh, big card. This used to be a normal size card but we fed it vitamins and hormones and it got to be really big like this. We'll leave it peek out over the top so we don't change it. That'd be dirty to change it the yeah. last minute. Okay, well, here's your big chance now, Mike. Uh, one through four. You have a feeling for one of those numbers? How about three? Three. Uh, you didn't want the one. Huh? I didn't want the one. Okay, I just don't want you coming back later saying, I wish I would have picked oh. the one. Okay, the three. Let's see what you got there. Oh, it would appear that you have selected the red one. Okay. Now, what about this prediction card we've had sitting up here all along? The moment of truth. Isn't the tension building in the room? You just, uh, yes. you know, and we, we, we milk this for everything we can. And then finally, ta-da! <laughs> hey, I want to thank you for that wonderful round of indifference. <laughs> it's not much of a trick, I know that. I mean, one in, uh, one in four, it's not like you're going to send a letter home to Aunt Jane saying, Dear Aunt Jane, we were just visiting the Riddles and this man did the most incredible thing. He picked one out of four. Not a big deal, but you do wish now you would have picked the one, I'll bet. Yeah. You see, if you would have picked the one, you would have, of course, gotten the red one. And uh, did you think I left this to chance? <laughs> <laughs> if you would have picked uh, the second one, you would have gotten the red one. And uh, it's probably not necessary to even point out that had you picked the fourth one, you would have gotten the red one. Uh, you see, even one out of four, we don't leave it to chance. But some people are willing to accept that on that, maybe I could have left it the chance. One in four is not that bad a deal. So what I'd like to do is ramp it up a little bit here, put that aside. But what if we have more possibilities? What about five different possibilities? Uh, years ago, there was a fellow from Duke University by the name of Dr. Ryan. Dr. Ryan came up with this whole idea of ESP. I think everybody's heard of it, extrasensory perception, presumably the ability to read somebody else's mind. I, some... I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Ryan had these cards made up. They're called Ryan cards, oddly enough. I wonder if that was chance. Uh, and he had symbols uh, that were very different from one another. The star, for example, the square, uh, the circle, the plus, and the wave. And uh, the way this little experiment worked is you'd get a couple of packs of these cards. Here would be one pack, and here would be a, a, another pack of the same thing, uh, the Rhine cards. And then uh, years ago, people used to entertain more easily than they do today at a party. They'd each have a pack of these cards. They'd set across from another on a table, and they would arrange them so that uh, they would be in some particular order. And then they would lay them out. So you'd lay out yours, I'd lay out mine. And if one pair matched up, we had a little ESP. If two pair matched up, we had a little more. <laughs> of course, this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sooner or later, there are going to be at least a few match up. So uh, what is the probability that uh, on these cards, what's the probability that if you were to mix them up and I mix them up or arrange them in a certain way, we'd arrange in the same sequence? Uh, well, that probability is, is measured with factorials. Mm -hmm. uh, with five different things, which is how many cards we have here, five different cards, the chance of us getting the same cards would be five times four times three times two times one. The reason for that is, on the, and you know this, of mm -hmm. course, very well being a mathematician, but the, uh, if your partner picked a wave, uh, mm -hmm. then we'd have one chance in five of getting right. a wave. And then if you got that, if your partner picked a square and then you picked a square, you'd have one chance in four of doing that. And down the line. Comes out to one chance in 120, basically, of getting them matched up. Now, compared to evolution, this is nothing. <laughs> it should happen every time. Yes. Compared to evolution, this is no big thing. So here's what I thought I'd do. Uh, we take one pack of these cards and uh, shuffle them up here. And then we take another pack and we would shuffle them up. I'm making sure you don't put anything up your sleeve. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not a thing up my sleeve but arms. Okay. <laughs> and notice, at no time do the hands need to leave the wrists. What okay. does that have to do with anything? I don't know. Uh, here's the way we're going to work it so it's very visible to everybody. We have this Lucite board with the numbers 1 through 5. And uh, I'm going to take the one pack of cards here. And uh, I'll just uh, put them under these little rubber band clips here. Uh, we'll mix them up all over the place here, so hopefully you won't know where they are. 
And then I'll have you try to just guesswork and, and match them all up, okay? Now let's put this one down here. Notice I'm not giving you any peaks on this thing here. You kind of have to do this one by uh, guesswork. There we got that there. Okay, your turn, Mike. <laughs> uh, got any feelings about this? One through five. Let me think. Uh, that should go in number two. Number two. Okay, we put that under the little mm -hmm. plastic board. Let me think hard. And then here. this one here. That's number one. Number one. Number one. <laughs> he's, he's an amazing guy. I don't know how he knows this stuff, but. Uh, and uh, that, this one. That's clearly a number five. I see. That would be the number five one. Okay, you've been waiting for that one all along. Yes. And then this There's one. There's a three. That's a three. That goes up here. Now, on the last one, amazingly enough, I'm actually going to predict where you will want that one placed. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, in position four. Now, <laughs> what a shame you know to. <laughs> What a shame to cover such a brain with hair. Not much, but a little hair. Okay, Mike, you will attest uh, right here before everybody that you had no idea what order I put them in, right? That's correct. And so there was no peaking, no prearrangement or anything. And what's the chance that we would uh, get these things that two minds would One work alike? One in 120. Okay. That's not too bad for the first time through. <laughs> you got it. Uh, now, you, do you really think I left that up to chance? Well, knowing you, Dr. Menton, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, you see, when things get that improbable, one chance out of 120, people say, no way. I did not leave that to chance. Well, just in case you th thought I might have left it to chance, uh, I thought I'd go one step up further yet. And this one gets a little closer to dealing with the problems that we would have with evolution. Uh, you see, evolution, one of its basic needs is to uh, produce proteins. We have 100,000 different proteins in our body, and the proteins are made up of little units called amino acids. And these amino acids are arranged, there's 20 of them that are used. Uh, they're arranged in a particular sequence for an average protein, 400, 500 long, you have 20 different kinds. You can imagine there's a lot of ways to put a protein together of average size. To illustrate the problem of making a protein, we're going to have to use a molecular modeling kit. I hope this doesn't get too technical for the audience, but without a molecular modeling kit, you just can't explain these things. And here is my kit. You get these from a scientific supply house. They're wonderful, snap beads. And what's so wonderful about them is uh, they illustrate the whole problem of making a protein. You see the snap beads have two ends. They have a button end and they have a socket end. And amino acids that make up proteins have two ends, a carboxy terminal and amino terminal end. And it isn't enough to just shake them up in the box and dump them out. They're not going to form a chain. What we need to do is to get the chain formed by making these bonds. Now to do this, you have to get the right ends together, uh, the button and the socket end. And notice it takes some energy to make that peptide bond. If you just left the peptide bond up to energy in our body, without the enzyme that gets her done, the chance of making a bond is not very high. In fact, it's been shown experimentally that with energy alone, you're about a thousand times more likely to break a bond than you are to make a new one. So uh, you really do need that enzyme. And by the way, to make this bond, you have to split water out of this molecule. And as you pointed out in your Origin of Life talks, any watery environment, which you would think would be necessary for life to form, would in fact inhibit the formation of life uh, because it's awfully hard to be removing water when you have a lot of water around you. So uh, we want to illustrate uh, the making of the peptide bond. And to do this, I've come up with a really crazy idea. Uh, let's see this one. <laughs> uh, take the word evolution there. What's the chance of spelling that? Uh, we have some alphabet cards here, and uh, we could remove uh, a pack, and they cleverly will spell evolution for us. E, V, O. Notice there's an O number one, because there's two O's, two O's are different. O number one, L, U, T, I, O number two, and N. So, uh, What's the chance if we were to just uh, go ahead, shuffle them up? Uh, when you get done shuffling, like evolution would do, just randomly okay. changing things, what's the chance they're going to come out to spell evolution? 
Well, assuming the two O's are different, which we're assuming, <laughs> it would be nine factorial. One chance in nine of getting the E out of nine letters, if you got that one in A to getting the V down the line. And that comes to one chance in 362,880 tries. Now, that's a long shot, but compared to evolution, this is nothing. <laughs> now, we're to, not going to try it that many tries, are we? No, no, we okay. don't have that kind of time. We're going to have to hustle right along, okay. yeah. And, and to do this, this is what I thought we would do. Uh, for, to make a peptide bond, I came up with this idea. We'd use a ribbon, and we would use some paper clips. I have one paper clip here for each card, okay? okay. So you want to hang on to the paper. You may shuffle the paper clips if you okay. like. And then we'll, we'll use this uh, ribbon here. And do you have any idea what we're going to do here or try to do? Oh, this is crazy. But I'm going to ask you uh, to shuffle the cards and we'll throw them in a sack, okay? And then you'll take the paper clips and you'll throw them in a sack. And then you'll throw the ribbon in the sack. And then we'll shake the sack twice, buchi buchi. You reach in, grab the ribbon, pull it out. And I'm hoping, by luck, that the cards will clip onto the ribbon with the paper clips to spell the word evolution. I told you it's a long shot, but compared to evolution, it's nothing. Now, rather than use a paper sack, I wanted to dress up the act a little bit. And so I asked the pastor of our church whether I could use, if I could use our collection bag. We have a new one. It's a nice velvet bag. And he said, Dave, you can not only borrow that bag, he says, you can keep it. I said, why is that? He said, since we got this new collection bag, our contributions have gone down to nothing. And you know what? I think I figured out why. If I reach into the bag here, there's a small flaw in the bottom of the bag, just a small hole. And uh, you see, it's like all my tricks. You can see right through it. <laughs> what I did was to mount a zipper in the bottom uh, to heal up the bottom of the bag. There we go. We have a bottom in it now. So well, we don't have millions of years for evolution. You've been shuffling the way, yes. have you? we've been shuffling. Okay, just throw the cards in the bag there. You see them down in the bag yes. down in there? Throw the paper clips on top of the cards. You see them down in there? Yes. Okay, ball up the ribbon, just throw it in the bag, okay? And remember I said I do the, the buchi buchi yes. thing like this? Okay, uh, and then reach right in, grab a hold of a ribbon there. If you got the hold of the ribbon, pull the ribbon on out. And grab that ribbon. And my goodness, what have you got there, Mike? Uh, uh, well, I think you need this end. I get this in. end. I'll take this end. And uh, by an incredible stroke of dumb luck, <laughs> we have assembled evolution. How many think I left that to chance? You know, as remarkable as this might seem to be, <laughs> this is nothing compared to evolution. The chance of putting together a protein is just simply over the top. And that's what we're going to discuss together next time. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mitten. My pleasure. Now, stay tuned for part two of this probability of evolution. Next, next session with Dr. David Mitten. Now, Dr. Mitten, in the next session, you're not going to make me disappear, are you? No, no, no more tricks. We're just going to dig right into the science of all of this in the next session. And I am looking forward to this next session. That was <laughs> okay. wonderful. Oh, thank you. God. My pleasure. God bless you, folks, and look forward to part two, Is Evolution Even Possible? If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.